um, open the December 6th Planning and Zoning Commission meeting. Um, excuse me, the January 3rd Planning and Zoning Commission meeting. Um, the first item on the agenda happens to be the December 6th uh, minutes. So, commissioners, y'all have had some time to see them. If you need to make any corrections, please do so at this time. If not, I'll accept a motion. Move that we approve minutes. Second. I've got a motion to approve and a second. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. And I am muting my phone right now. If anybody else forgot to, please follow my lead. Um, the, we're going to go out of order just a little bit. I believe most everybody here is for the uh, SD 19.06 River Horse Subdivision. And uh, since I hear a few people coughing out there and the place is packed, uh, we'll go ahead and do River Horse uh, first and uh, get that done and then we'll go through our the rest of our agenda in the normal order so um, hunter are you going to be the presenter on that thank you mr chairman um so this is a little bit unusual i'm going to give a little preamble before i show the slides river horse subdivision was a case that was originally before you in February of 2019 for preliminary plat approval. The, um, that began construction a few months ago, and when it did, um, it, it surprised a lot of people, especially in the Jason North, North Station subdivision, and there was a lot of construction traffic through the neighborhood. Um, through the course of that, there was some uh, public records requests that were submitted and there was documents as y'all know we've had multiple meetings dating back from 2018 about this subdivision and north station back in 2005 but in, in response to that public records request we could not lay hands on the letters to adjacent property owners everything else about the case was done properly in the zoning ordinance in the subdivision case but because we couldn't lay hands on that letter we're here before you tonight we think the best course of action is to get that preliminary plat approved again um, we're presenting it as old new business as it was submitted to you in 2019 so with that said this was um, there is a new owner and in your packet you do see a letter from the new owner uh, this was uh, originally approved by 68 ventures who has sold it to Dilworth development out of Auburn the engineer record is Dewberry. This is a property on 22 acres. And as you can see on the left, this is actually since 2019, this had a zoning case assigned with it as well right before this. So this has been rezoned to R2. The property connects through uh, North Station subdivision which was approved in 2005 with this Stub Street, through Calibri Street, through a wetland, into the proposed River Horse subdivision. Uh, there was no trip generations, uh, enough for a traffic study, but the, the green space, space plan is, is on the screen here. As the planning commissioners know, a subdivision of this density, residential <laughs> subdivision, requires 10% green space this was provided more than three times that amount it's 36 percent green space uh, and the detention does not count and did not count in 2019 at all within that green space calculation there's a darker strip on, along blueberry that was there as a as a planning strip uh, a screening the wetlands do, does split between river horse and north station uh, the horticulturist looked at the tree protection this is mostly open field so there wasn't a whole lot of trees to protect um, except for what was in the wetlands and protected other than the crossing that was uh, provided and I think was surprised a lot of people the site data on the plat preliminary plat is shown um, again we've got 25 lots those are R2 size 
So for anybody that's looking, that's uh, a minimum of 75 foot wide and 10,500 square feet each of area. The largest lot within there is almost 17,000. The smallest lot is 11,200 square feet. So larger than the minimum requirements. The total common area is, and that, that includes roads, detention, green space, wetlands, is 57.2%. So when we look at density, it's 1.4 lots per acre. Setback standard R2, and we have City of Fairhope providing water and sewer, Riviera Utilities providing electric, and AT&T providing telephone. So this is just was a schematic of what's uh, shown in place, and, and you can see the wetlands are not uh, shown here. The wetland buffer on the very bottom we looked at, I looked at this and was the detention in the wetlands. It's not, that's just the hat showing the, the three areas. Uh, this is, the de detention is meeting the requirements in our subdivision regulations and the 80% TSS removal. Uh, traffic was, traffic calming was provided. Uh, and again, the wetland buffer, as you know, is there and proper signage has been done. I will kind of give you an update on where we're at here because this is unusual. Usually when we see this, it's on paper, it's designs. This is all in the field. So they have pulled the per appropriate permits with the assumption the preliminary plat was valid. They have went through pre-construction meetings. They've went through pulling all the permits through ADEM and the Corps of Engineers for the wetlands crossing. So we are here to uh, correct this potential mishap, if you will. Um, we just can't find a, a letter that we were uh, sent out and, and we're here to correct that. There is, uh, the city is working and throughout all this, there was a lot of traffic going through Calibri, as I mentioned, uh, construction traffic. And we have a county maintained road on Blueberry that was not built to a standard that is, was in bad shape. And Eric and I have worked with the, the builder or the road builder many times. And, it, you know, there was a, you know, can you move over to Blueberry and get traffic there? They did that. And then the county said, hey, you're going to be responsible for fixing the road. So they moved back to Calibri. The, and, and now we've, the city has come back and said, we will make repairs if you just use Blueberry. So they are doing that. But in the, in the, also happening in the conversations, the city and the county are working together to possibly connect Blueberry to Calibri. Because as you see on the, the little blurb on the screen, there's a cul-de-sac provided in the preliminary plat because it wasn't connecting to Blueberry. So that's the emergency vehicle turnaround. And we are working to connect Blueberry all the way up to Calibri. Uh, that's not finalized. We don't know the answer to that. But the question did come up, if we did that, could there be two additional lots there? We don't foresee a problem with that, assuming it meets all our regulations. There's plenty of green space. So we're, instead of coming back and revising that preliminary plat, we're, staff is proposing a condition of approval. With that being said, the first two rec uh, conditions of approval are carried over from what we saw two years ago, or in 2019, February 2019, standard notes revising the O&M plan when they come back for final to reflect a five-year maintenance schedule instead of three and then add a note that the green space is this is our standard notes is not the responsibility of Fairhope to maintain um, or any of any or all of the required green space the third one that proposed by staff is if Blueberry Lane connects to Calibri Street the number of lots approved at final plat may be increased from 25 to 27 if all other regulations of the city are met in lieu of the currently required cul-de-sac nearest to the Blueberry Lane parcel slash right-of-way. All other regulations are in, in this case, just for example, I know there's been some confusion with SB 107. This is a city of Fairhope property. This would be the subdivision regulations, the zoning ordinance, the BMPs, the red soil and clays, all of the regulation tree ordinance, all of those things. And to do that, we would vet that before we ever put that in front of you for final plat that it met that. But this just wouldn't have to come back for, for a, amending the preliminary plat and do it here. 
and this is, uh, this is under assumption that we can make that connection happen working with the county. So with that said, who uh, is responsible for putting the road up, taking Blueberry up to the cul-de-sac? That would be a partnership with the county and the city. And so, how that works, I don't know the final answer. Yeah, it could be that the county says we don't, it's not on our radar. If you're willing to fund it, we'll we'll happily do it. It might be that they, we have to take that right of way. It might be the county says, well, yeah, we've had that plan for years. I just don't know the the yeah, final answer that. for that. Um, I'm optimistic. Are you, what about the rest of Blueberry Lane? You said it's not to city standards. That's right. What is uh, and and then what's the responsibility of the city in terms of repairing Blueberry? after the contractor does whatever he does to it we've committed to repairing that and repairing it to the condition as it was prior to the use or to making it our city standard we have we have committed to repairing it to the condition it was before but as i think we we talked about that's not the best end result it's no. actually bringing that up to a a, a little higher standard um, this subdivision now being connected triggers a home count over 35 that actually needs a secondary exit for entrance uh, as y'all know through our fire emergency response and things like that so what that has to be is a lower standard than a public road so that just has to be a it can be great gravel asphalt it just has to hold the weight of a fire truck so we're looking at all those options um, but I think the city has committed to bring it back to a minimum of what it is. I don't think that's, it's not worth it to go out and just do that. Do you have, do you have the right of way, sufficient right of way, all the way up? So this was where a lot of the, or I think originally what happened, this is a county maintained road, but it's in a single tax piece of property described as a right of way. We'll have to, I mean, that you can see kind of where the bureaucracy of county, city, and single tax working through that's going to take a little time while we don't have I an know somebody with single tax, you probably could get a <laughs> grant out of it. <laughs> uh, yes, and I, I do think it, it winds, it needs to be a public right of way. Well, you, you know, I just I, don't want to speak for the county would have to be, you know, there's, there's, a, when you start looking at the options that can take place and how that would happen, there's a lot of options. Um, and and it's just going to take a little time to figure out those final. You details. know what the biggest the biggest culprit for uh, stream siltation in our county is, right? Dirt roads. Anything that you uh, to me, if anything that could be done to eliminate that, especially in an area that's got. So Blueberry is not a dirt road. Not a dirt road. I understand, but I mean, you're going to extend it, or you're going to widen it, and you were talking about yeah. graded slash gravel or whatever. No. I, I can assure you, it's not anywhere in the city of Fairhope's plans to be putting a gravel or dirt road out. There. Okay. The, uh, you know how we get to that point? I don't know the mechanism, but that's not our intent. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Hunter. Mm -hmm. um, would anybody on behalf of the owner wish to speak at this time? Um, is anybody here on behalf of the owner? Yeah, I'm Justin Brett with Dewberry. Okay. I, I designed this thing several, well, four years ago, so if right. there's any questions I can't answer, I'm happy to do it. Okay. If you don't have anything to add right now, I'll open the public hearing, and then uh, any questions that the public may have, I will write down and then call you up at the end of the public hearing, if that's okay. Um, just for people in, in the audience, if you have not been to a meeting before, um, this is, we have two things that we deal with here at the Planning and Zoning Commission. Uh, one is zoning, <coughs> and zoning, uh, zoning's become an ordinance, and only the city council has the authority to approve ordinances, so anything that we uh, do in those cases are simply uh, recommendations to the city council. The other uh, thing we do, which is this, is a, our subdivisions and subdivisions we actually have the authority to approve or deny. And with that, um, I would like to say it's not really a taste thing. We have subdivision regulations, and within reason, if the, uh, if the subdivision meets those regulations, we pretty much by, by law have to 
uh, approve the subdivisions. I've been on this Planning and Zoning Commission for a little bit over 20 years, and uh, twice we denied subdivisions that met the subdivision regs, and both times the court sent them back to us and said we had to approve them. So it's, it's not that we just, you know, we aren't the taste police. We basically look at the subdivision regulations and see, you know, do, does this meet the subdivision regulations and, or does it not? In this case, we'll be deciding does this meet the subdivision regulations of 2019? So that'll be, you know, what we'll be looking at. Um, so without any further ado, um, you know, if somebody says something that, you know, you were going to say, you know, uh, don't feel like you've got to come up and speak. Um, but, uh, you know, I'll open the public hearing, let people speak. If stuff starts to get redundant at that point, I'll go ahead and close the public hearing. So at the end, when you, when I, uh, the public hearing, we do have to have your name and your address for the record. So if you'll tell Allison when you come, come up your name and address, uh, and then try to keep your comments to three minutes or less, please. Um, Allie, excuse me, I'm going to try to extend your name, <laughs> Allie. Um, so anyway, so uh, at this time, I'll open the public hearing. So if you've got any comments, uh, please come up to the microphone. Yes, sir. My name is Bob Walsh, and I'm on 505 North Station Drive in Fairhope. That's in North Station Subdivision. And I'm president of the HOA there. And speaking on behalf of our subdivision, it's very unfortunate and disappointing as taxpayers and voters that we are having to be here today for this meeting. North Station homeowners never had the opportunity to express concerns at the two previous City of Fairhope Planning Commission meetings regarding the rezoning and subsequent development of River Horse. The North Station HOA nor the homeowners on your distribution list received the required mail notices. The Fairhope Zoning Ordinance states that names and addresses shall be from the latest records of the county revenue office and accuracy of the list shall be the applicant's responsibility. The ordinance also states that within land with it, that where land within 300 feet involves leasehold property, the names and addresses of the landowner and the leasehold improvements should be, shall be provided to the city. The homeowners on the distribution list did not receive the letter, and in fact, two of the three homeowners on the list are more than 300 feet outside of the 300 foot limit and two properties within the 300 feet were skipped and never, never notified. So North Station is a leasehold property and the homeowners on the distribution list are as well and they did not <coughs> receive that letter. Fair, Fairhope Single Tax was not on the distribution lease, list for that mail notice as well. It appears to us that the city somewhat has a pick and choose attitude on what natural areas such as the wetlands are, will be protected. Mr. Diaz stood before this commission on January 28, 2019, and he stated that the proposed rezoning of the property had three access routes, Lawrence Road, Blueberry, Blueberry Lane, and North Station. Then he said, and I quote, North Station would be the most difficult to use because of the wetlands. And just one week later, on February the 4th, 2019, the commission approved coming through North Station and the degradation of the, nat the natural wetland buffer. If he was correct, why was it so easy to get him approved, to get that notice approved? We've been told numerous times by the mayor and her staff that it's all about connectivity. The tracery was approved at the same time and it has no co connectivity. As a matter of fact, the tracery has exactly the same road set up that North Station had. Clearly some zoning violations have been made, but what's done is done and we can't change that. So moving forward, uh, we'd like to make sure that the North Station, we are requesting that all heavy construction traffic in the future, as well as any subsequent deliveries of building materials to be, be on the county maintained Blueberry Lane. This is the most logical access to the River Harsh development. Blueberry Land abuts the Del development and should be the primary entrance to River Horse. The plat requested for approval should designate Blueberry as the primary access. Thanks to the city for offering $30,000 as insurance against road damages, the majority of the heavy traffic is now on Blueberry Lane. And we'd like to thank Mayor Sullivan for her leadership and her uh, to make this happen. 
Blueberry Lane is north of Gaffer Extension, and it should be upgraded to the same quality as it is on the south side of Gaffer Extension. And we request that the City of Fairhope take the leadership with the developer, Baldwin County, and First Colony, if needed, to take any necessary steps to ensure the upgrade of Blueberry Lane. <coughs> From a safety standpoint, there should be no semi-trailers loaded with culverts and large dump trucks using our local streets in North Station for this type of traffic. Our two streets are only 22 feet wide with a paved surface. It's very concerning when you have a community where children play freely and many residents walk their pets several times daily. We had children standing on the Gayfer Extension to catch the school bus while massive dump trucks were in a bind trying to come into the neighborhood. This is just an accident waiting to happen. With respect to the wetlands destruction, the North Station homeowners would like to go on record that we have been adamantly against the destruction of the wetland corridor between the two subdivisions. And for some reason, the city made the decision not to apply their own wetland ordinance regulations. When landowners purchase our own property with wetlands, they already know what the limitations are because of the environmental sensitivity. And we are well aware that ADEM and the Corps of Engineers issued a permit for the destruction in June of 21. If we had been notified back in 2019, maybe this would have never happened. Because of residents' complaints, ADEM has already issued warning letters to the developer for violations in the wetlands corridor. With respect to utility services, we want to be ensured that the development of River Horse will not degrade utility services in North Station. The infrastructure problems being incurred within the City of Fair of Hope have been well publicized. The city has just, in the last couple of days, put a moratorium on future developments. We don't want North Station to be written up on any publications. We are concerned that the city has not adequately addressed the utilities issue, and we want to make sure that um, that happens, and then and, and any, any engineer, engine, internal engineering review addressing those situations, we'd like to see them. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Bob. This way. Hi. My name is Leah Biggs. I'm at 109, excuse me, 10491 Canyon Drive, which is accessed by Blueberry Lane. We understand the necessity to have construction vehicles use Blueberry Lane to access the construction of River Horse <coughs> subdivision. We are not here to dispute that. We are here, we are comfortable with allowing that neighborhood to continue to have uh, those heavy construction vehicles on Blueberry Lane until construction is complete. We are here to request that that road, that entrance to River Horse be blocked when construction is complete for several reasons. Um, in the, the slides that we were seeing earlier, there is a 40 foot wide tree line that is bordered by wetlands. The extension of Blueberry Lane would require the destruction of all of those trees. So we've heard that part of the reason that Blueberry Lane is being proposed to be expanded and extended is to provide a second access point for River Horse and North Station. Due to a requirement that we, this is what I'm saying here is hearsay that there may be a requirement by the city that neighborhoods of this size have two entrances and two exits. Yet, Hollow Brook, Montrose Woods, the Woodlands, Falling Water, Longleaf, all those neighborhoods along with many others in Fairhope have one entrance and one exit. Additionally, extending Blueberry Lane uh, approximately 600 feet past the northern current terminus of Blueberry Lane um, would require the destruction of hundreds of trees, many of which are old established oak trees. We have pictures of those trees to leave with this committee. Uh, we also have a petition from all of the residents who live on Blueberry Lane and Canyon Drive petitioning the extension and expansion of Blueberry Lane. Sydney City Ordinance, or Fairhope City Ordinance 1444, which is a tree and landscape ordinance, says plants, particularly trees, benefit the city and its residents by supplying oxygen, absorbing carbon dioxide, by reducing soil erosion and storm water runoff, glare from vehicles, wind, heat, noise, and other offensive conditions. Landscaping screens and buffers maintain and enhance the character of neighborhoods and generally create a safer, more attractive, and more pleasant living and working environment for all residents of the city of Fairhope. 
Removing so many majestic trees would not only remove the incredible natural value of the trees, but it would also reduce the property values on both sides of the tree line. The Tree and Landscape Ordinance specifically addresses how trees help protect the environment from soil erosion and stormwater runoff, and this proposed road extension would encroach on a wetland area at, at the north end. Fairhope City Wetland Ordinance 1370 says the loss of wetlands has increased downstream water pollution, flooding, and erosion, resulting in the loss of wildlife habitat. Further loss of wetland quality and quantity endangers the public health, safety, and general welfare of the residents of the city and those residing within the permitting jurisdiction. Um, we heard tonight for the first time that the request is for the city of Fairhope to share the expense of extending this road and expanding the road. That's an unreasonable and considerable expense, uh, which is also unnecessary. Thank you. Okay. Um, Hunter, in the plan of extending Blueberry Lane, there's, there wouldn't be any plan to extend it 600 feet all the way to the wetlands it would just be an extra like 100 or 120 feet roughly to caliber street correct that that's correct okay. yeah um yeah the the no the 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 right of way goes goes much further but uh so this is actually to, canyon drive here Right. The plan would just be going just a little and bit it would past just Canyon be an Drive. Extension to here. So it wouldn't be the full. The rest of it would stay wooded. all the way through the wetlands to the north. That has been unopened. There's no plans to open that further, any further than where Calibri Street intersects with that right of way. Right. So in, in the conversation we have, and I did say there, we're looking at all options and sharing cost or we're taking cost. That's not something I can figure out. I know that's a process that has to work itself through. But in our, when we drove out, we did recognize there, she, even in that little strip, there's some pretty fantastic trees. So we've already talked about how we can work around those and, and what we can do there. Okay, thank you, Hunter. All right, anybody else wish to speak to this item? Hi there, my name is Greg Biggs. I live at uh, 671 Ridgewood Drive, but the property is adjacent to this, is 10491. Um, <coughs> I just want to speak to uh, some more things just to elaborate more on the expansion of Blueberry. Um, with that, you know, all that talk, there's no talk about widening Blueberry or, you know, I heard earlier just throwing some gravel on it or whatnot, but I mean, that's a residential road. Is there any plans to widen that to two lane? <clears throat> Excuse me. That's I, I what the city any, is talking about. On the table right that's now. what the city would like to do in their conferring with the county about that okay because if that were to be an access to um, to River Horse subdivision it would certainly have to be wide into a two-lane road yeah because we were just worried about that thoroughfare through North Station back to River Horse back around because that's going to be a constant loop of traffic we Correct. know it's going to be from teenagers to people that live in there to everybody so yeah um, if there's so that, not that's what Hunter's talking about is, is the one of the possibilities would be that that cul-de-sac is taken away and then the road you know would be extended that 120 feet but that would only be you know based upon the road being brought up to a you know to a safe standard of you know two lanes with the line down the middle you couldn't have that kind of traffic going right. on you know right now it's just kind of a Right. You know, going in and out of, you know, kind of a rural access to your house doesn't take the garbage can out and that kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, it's definitely a one lane right now. Um, well, what about canyons? Is there any, I mean, did, we're strictly talking about blueberry here. That's it. There's no coming off canyon or anything. No. Nothing. Okay. And, and just to refresher, and, and what our goal, immediate goal is meet the minimum of that fire 
uh, apparatus and weight, and if we can do better than that, I think that's something to strive for. Uh, Canyon Drive is actually not a right-of-way. Canyon Drive is easements, I believe, through individual pieces of property, so you know, there's no access to that. I do believe there's been some residents maybe here have, and this is talking with the county that's reached out to the county about doing something with Canyon Drive, but that actually was, I believe, started before this project that we came to fruition. Okay, uh, yeah, that was my only concern, was just the thoroughfare of traffic, looking at that as a two-lane road, because right now it's just a one lane, and it's already been damaged a little bit, so, um, and we would obviously ask that that not, that extension not be taken down into those wetlands, that it be capped off right there at the entrance. Yeah, at that point it would not be, but, you know, it's like I tell people with, you know, right-of-ways, if somebody down there wants to develop that land, right. that's in the legal rights that's what the right of ways are for okay but there's no but i'm not saying anybody's got any plans or anything i'm just saying those are what they're there for okay it just contradicts some things with the city ordinance trees and all that i mean it seems like you know between the that and the property values it seems like those want to be maintained at all costs and not uh, just be taken out i mean uh, they're pretty old growth oaks back there so yeah it's beautiful back there i've shown it so, a few times yeah okay well really thank you yes Thank you, Mr. Biggs. Anybody else wish to speak to this item? Yes, sir. I got. Oh, you, go ahead, Dave. No, you're yeah. Sir, if, if you want to come on up and just. I'm going to clear the house. I got it. I got it quick. No, I, I, Josh Johnson, 10210 Canyon Drive. I've got just a tiny little nuts and bolts. It's more of a question. Has anybody, like, I heard. They say that uh, Blueberry Lane is a county maintained road. Does the county really own Blueberry or is that private? Well, that's the million dollar question. It's, because it's, that's, it's, that's kind of, so let me run a scenario by. Yeah. I've got a, I've got a, a document from the county stating that it is county maintained. Yes, correct. He asked if it was county owned. My turn. So they run all this construction traffic through there. They make it look like a road in Afghanistan. Then somebody says, you know what? County says, we're not paying for it. Developers like, it ain't my job. They leave and everybody that lives down that road's got to fix it. With what? Yeah, well, if you heard Hunter so, said already that the city is requiring the construction traffic and said that they would make any repairs necessary. But if it's not owned, if it's private, what, I mean, what, what guarantee do we have that it actually happens other than a handshake or what, what, what happens if? What happens if a meteorite hits it tomorrow? I don't know, but you know, to me, the city stating that they'll take care of it's enough of, you know, if we're going to start calling the city liars, then we might as well not even be here. But if it's a, but the, but on the front end, it didn't get, so if it's not, my, my point is, if it's not owned by the county, then I don't know how it got paved. But I don't think that there's any documents that says that it is owned by anybody. It's not owned by the county. The land itself is owned Who by the paved it? single. County? It was before yeah. I got there. Well, I don't know. Been more than likely the county paved it. It sounded to me like the city has made a commitment that they're going to be involved be in repairing it. Fantastic. It's just there's, and I'm speaking for my neighbors, I don't want the road to get destroyed and then there's well, no look, guarantee that it actually gets look, Josh, there, there are issues there and, you know, I wear another hat with the Single Tax Corporation and we keep finding properties like this that we own and I assure you we're you know, trying to get it out of our name. Um, ours being the single tax, you know, we've had, you know, properties like that. We would much rather the city or the county um, own it. So, you know, don't think that there's gonna be any hindrance on our part of trying to say, hey, we own this asphalt. Um, so that's that's where we're at. Okay. These Thanks, things man. get done, you know, through times. Those are good questions though. Unfortunately. <laughs> David. 
Okay, maybe I can settle. I can settle s some historical questions. Why well, was Blueberry, I call it North Blueberry Lane. It is that. It is a lane, a single lane. It was originally paved by the county because at that time, a real deal disabled American veteran in a wheelchair requested it because there were washouts in the swag on North Blueberry Lane, which is a wetland. Everybody got that? Blueberry Lane crosses a wetland. So is this new subdivision? Yes. Hey. Uh, let, let's please just address the, the chair, please. Thank you. And it was paid with one lift of asphalt. And my checkered past, I'm familiar with asphalt paving. Right, by the way, we're discussing tonight the subdivision and, um, you know, we're not discussing the, if, if access is given to this, Blueberry Lane is going to be improved to, you know, to a legal standard, not not Can we talk a, about that access? I have been speaking. I've asked yeah. the mayor to call me, but sure. she has not. I have been talking with many of the people in the county. Right. They return my telephone calls. Okay. okay. What we want, all of us, is a single lane emergency access that is required by the adoption of the firefighting standards. I am a safety engineer. I'm familiar with NFPA. I'm not familiar with the standard that the city and the county have adopted. But when we bought the property out there, we recognized that someday there would be development. And we thought we could live with it. I also told the president of North Station, whom I know, my wife has known him for years. I showed him where the cutouts are. There are two. There's one that's not even mentioned. It would probably go back to Blueberry. And I told everybody that would listen, this is coming. It's going to happen. It may not happen in our lifetime, but it is going to happen. So the engineers with the county have told me that it can be a one lane. That's all we want, a one lane that will fulfill the obligation for emergency egress into the subdivision. We do not want a two-lane road. Has anybody else got any historical questions? I might be able to answer. No, I have a current one. Who is we? We? Yeah, you say we don't want. Everybody stand up. No, don't stand okay. up. Don't know. Don't we, want to see you stand we are, up. We are the residents of North Blueberry Lane and Canyon Drive. Canyon Drive area. Okay. Yes. All right. All right. Thank you, sir. All right. Anybody else wish to speak to this item? Yes, sir. Uh, Richard Wakefield, 21049 Blueberry Lane. We in approximately four to five hundred feet along the uh, southern part of northern Blueberry Lane. Um, our concern is primarily the amount of traffic and also not necessarily accessing the um, subdivision in question, but if the road were to be expanded. Um, along our property alone, there are over 25 live oak trees that are very tall, very well established, and any kind of expansion of the road would likely cause the removal of all those trees and the barrier woods that block Blueberry Lane from our home. We have lived in subdivisions, nothing wrong with subdivisions. We specifically purchased this property in mid-2021 as an opportunity to be near a city but have a country feel. Our property is built back on Blueberry Lane it has a barrier wood line along Blueberry Lane. If that road were to be expanded, I believe that that 
wood line would likely be removed, making our property and also impacting other residents of the property along Blueberry Lane to go from a quiet country lane to another part of a busier roadway and open subdivision, opening up and exposing the homestead that we bought with specific ideas in mind to a much larger road with considerably more traffic. I'm not sure if this directly addresses the subdivision in question, but the extension of Blueberry Lane and possible expansion definitely would affect our family as well as other residents along that. So we'd like that to be considered. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wakefield. Anybody else wish to speak to the site? All right, in that case, I'll go ahead and close the public hearing at this time. Um, Hunter, do you have anything to add? a few questions um, it, you know this has been an interesting process and I want to kind of highlight one of the challenges we see every day but may not be public knowledge you know we're not immune to the the rumors on the street the Facebook post all of those things I've been accused of being in a developer's pocket I didn't work here when this was originally approved um, there, there's been quite a few challenges but I think what we're seeing tonight two groups of people that are passionate about where they live and have very good points come up quite frequently in our daily life and how do we mediate that um, you know we, we've heard from one get the traffic off of us we don't care what happens and then you know this, you know mediating this process it, it can be challenging um, I'm gonna kind of go through some of the questions that, that came up uh, Mr. Walls talked about the 300 feet. The zoning ordinance requires 300 feet notifications. Those were done properly and there were a few people within North Station that did receive those. Um, I don't know if they're who live there now, but what we're talking about here is a subdivision case. It has nothing to do with the zoning ordinance. It is about the subdivision regulations and that requires adjacent property owners. It's state law. It's what we have to do. So I, I get where the confusion can come in, but that's a that's a little bit of a challenge to uh, understand. And and you know I, I believe we're here to correct the letters we can't find, and that was a subdivision. So we did check with and make sure the HOA got their address right with the tax assessors. It was wrong. Um, and and that is correct we made sure we got the right one uh, in in play on this one um, I do want to commend them the North Station folks have brought some some shortcomings to our attention on some things and we're we've already changed some of the ways we're doing things um, signage that's placed out in the street we're getting signed we're getting pictures of that just to have on record that it was done because somebody times people move those the difficult nature that was talked about and Wayne did say in a zoning case at the City Council meeting that it will be difficult difficult means it requires more permitting than Blueberry Lane but the same thing would have happened at the Treasury uh, I believe y'all had the discussions in Planning Commission where there's more impact to the wetlands cutting through Treasury it was less of an impact cutting through here and there was a stub street approved in 2005 um, we really can't designate primary entrance on a plat that's not something we stand, you know normally do so whatever that becomes um, it is what it will be if it's a public road it's a public road that's kind of the root of our challenges here we've got two public roads one group wants construct contractors use it the other one wants you know vice versa and we're, we're kind of in the middle trying to mediate wetlands ordinance actually allows this wetlands crossing I don't know if anybody's had a chance to read it what it says is there can be a crossing it makes it more difficult so what Wayne was referring to in the difficult pro procedures is correct permitting through ADEM through uh, Corps of Engineers and all that has been done and was permitted properly um, I, d I, d I think I mentioned this already but I do want I, I do acknowledge that Blueberry Lane right there in this little connection has some you know pretty amazing trees and we've already been talking about those and how we can work around that um, I can't speak to whether that'll be a one lane a two lane 
uh, we'll we'll do what what was best. But just I want the North Station folks that did, that didn't realize there was a Stub Street there to understand. There's also already two more on the platted. There could be a connection to subdivisions on the east and west of them. There's nothing in plans, and if anybody that owns those lots are listening to me, please don't bring it forward. <laughs> We have enough subdivisions and workload right now. I'd love to see that remain woods for another 50 years. Um, fire we've discussed, um, and I believe majority of those things are, were after that were about Blueberry Lane. Um, we've, we've made a commitment to repair, and we've also looking into what the future can be on that connection. And that, that's what we can do. This is preliminary plat for River Horse. Are they meeting the subdivision regulations? Do we approve that preliminary plat? So if there's any questions the commission has for me that I didn't answer, if there was any questions the public brought up that I didn't answer, I'm, I'm right here to answer them for you. Engineers here, if there's any drainage uh, technical questions about utilities, we'll be happy to answer those as well. Thank you, Honor. Commissioners, any questions, concerns? Um, you know, Josh, you made some interesting points, and one that I'd you know like to comment on. You know, that being a right of way, and you know, owned by the single tax corporation, but then the county says that currently they're responsible for the maintenance of it, and have a document, and you know, it's not. If I live there, I mean, how comfortable would I be of that? I mean, I'd rather it be a county right of way or a city right of way, and in a road that I knew there was always going to be legal access to go you know to my property and and one other thing with that you know being a right-of-way I mean there's tons of land on either side that could come in and widen that you know at their own cost tomorrow I mean honest to God if, if we made a mistake on this it's probably making a mistake not to require river horse to widen it and you know get that you know cleared up then but it was kind of overlooked at the time of you know is that a right of way or not due to the fact of it not being owned by the county or the city like normally they are so there is some kind of you know unusual things that were kind of overlooked you know based on that that i would if i lived there probably want to be cleaned up and i would want you know some government entity to have a road there that, that was owned where i knew that you know that's it um because you know ultimately like hunter said this is not the last subdivision that's going to be built in fairhope and it's and you know you live out there and what you think is the country and then all of a sudden it's not i mean look at 104 and some of those places that have just you know gone crazy um but but you made some very good points about you know that that property and kind of its ownership and i understand you know what you're saying there but i kind of think further about you know getting kind of that into the hands of a government entity at some point just for the cleanliness of it but that's all that I have to say. Uh, commissioners, any concerns, questions? If not, I'll entertain a motion. I move we approve SD 1906 River Horse Subdivision with staff recommendations. I've got a motion to approve subject to staff recommendations. Do I have a second? Second. I've got a motion to second. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed to say nay. Uh, motion passes unanimously. All right, um, we're going to move on. I'll give a couple minute pause if people want to leave before we move on with the agenda. Um, Allie, put me down as an abstention on the, uh, I don't remember if I voted on the minutes or not, but put me as an abstention since I missed the last meeting. Okay, yeah, thank you. Did, um, the vote that you guys just made, did that approve it to go to 27 lots? Triple speed. Or did, did that approve from 25 to 27? There's certain things that happen. So that was not an approval for 27 lots. They, they will have to come back. Can you request that their plat is more that their plat is more specific in the road. All right. All right. All right. Can I get this petition? Oh. Allie. Allie. Yes. And Allie will give you her phone. 
And Allie will give you her cell phone number and her home phone and tell you when she eats dinner. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, moving right along. Um, next item on the agenda, Kim, if you'd like to go ahead and make your very enlightening, interesting stormwater management program, <laughs> a.k.a. SWMPP. I know y'all look forward to this every year. I, I thought so, you said you were going to bring cookies this year. Oh, last year. I'm sorry. I, I forgot that. those. I baked them in there at the house. Okay. I'll have to eat them. <laughs> But this is the stormwater management program plan for the city of Fairhope. It's a component of our stormwater permit with, um, with ADEM, the MS4 permit. And one of our requirements is that we put the stormwater management plan for, up for public review. And you have a, um, we have a link I'm going to show you, a five minute video that tells you all about it. I've heard from citizens' complaints. Turn the volume up a bit. The whole river's covered in trash. Our driveway's been washed away. There's an awful smell. I'm sorry. Joe, do we have any volume we can pump up? Is that, is that as loud as we get? Connected to stormwater runoff. All are important. All deserve our attention. So, how do we go about creating a clean water future together? I can read it. First, we must recognize that as communities grow, the need to manage stormwater increases. Done properly, a well managed stormwater program simply helps nature's water cycle, promotes community health, and assures our lifestyle remains intact and attractive to new residents and businesses. A survey of over 1,000 Alabama residents commissioned by the Mobile Bay National Estuary Program reveals six common values that are most important to quality of life here. The issue of stormwater runoff plays a major role in each value identified. In 1987, amendments to the Clean Water Act obligated the EPA and ADEM to require urban areas to regulate stormwater. The Municipal Separate Storm Sewer System, or MS4, refers to all stormwater conveyance structures managed by a municipality, county, or other designated non-governmental facilities. MS4 stormwater programs are developed to prevent harmful pollutants from being washed and or dumped into our stormwater conveyance structures and ultimately into our waters. The MS4 permitting program was introduced in a phased approach starting in 1990. Larger municipalities, having the greatest potential for stormwater impacts, were permitted first. In 1999, smaller municipalities were also brought under the MS4 permitting process. MS4s that are designated by ADEM are required to obtain a permit and develop a stormwater management program. Your program must be detailed within a stormwater management plan. It is important to understand that this requirement is not just an unfunded mandate. It is vital to the health of your community that the public becomes stormwater savvy in order to safeguard water quality and quality of life. Without this education, the value of everything in our lives is diminished and complaints rise. The requirement states that your stormwater management plan shall include the following minimum steps, also known as minimum control measures. One, a public education and public involvement program highlighting stormwater. Your education program can include brochures, public workshops, and a website with easily understood information for residents to follow. Include a public participation program to ensure community input on stormwater matters. Interacting with residents on stormwater related committees such as watershed groups, Alabama Cooperative Extension, your local soil and water conservation district, and the Mobile Bay National Estuary Program helps connect citizens to the effort. Two, illicit discharge detection and elimination. Your plan must include mapping and inspecting stormwater conveyance structures such as pipes, ditches, and detention ponds. Ordinances are needed prohibiting illicit discharges of oil, grease, paints, wash water, and other pollutants. Three, construction site runoff control. Your program should include monitoring of all construction sites, even your city's projects, for stormwater impacts from land disturbance. Your program must include land erosion and sediment control, inspections that are documented, and you must have enforcement capabilities. Four, post-construction runoff control. Your plan will encourage the development of post-construction stormwater management 
to minimize pollutants in new and redeveloped areas. Private and public stormwater facilities must be inspected and maintained. Ordinances that require facility maintenance must be put in place. Five, participants are required to have good housekeeping in place for the control and reduction of stormwater pollutants from public facilities. This includes street sweeping, litter control, employee training and management of all environmental permits such as scrap tire facilities and underground storage tanks, USTs. Six, stormwater program monitoring is required to provide data to assess how effective and adequate your program is at reducing pollutants. For larger and some smaller MS4s, this includes water quality sampling for pollutants determined by the permit. Seven, larger MS4s and some designated smaller MS4s are also required to cover other items, such as industrial stormwater runoff, spill prevention and response, hazardous waste, and the application of pesticides, herbicides, and fertilizers. Eight, finally, reporting is necessary. Your program must document all steps and report to ADEM annually to verify that the program reduces stormwater pollutants and minimizes impacts to our waters. A comprehensive stormwater management plan is a powerful tool to help reduce complaints, improve the health of your community, and ultimately protect and enhance the things we value most. Your program may be managed through internal staff or consultants based on your municipality or organization size, trained staff, and budget. At any rate, it is important to realize full compliance is not optional. Many states are levying fines that reach into the millions of dollars. Stormwater runoff affects us all on personal and economic levels. It is a challenge you can meet as a public employee through your work with citizens and through your valuable community connections. Let's work together to create a clean water future for Alabama today and for generations to come. For more information, please visit the Alabama Department of Environmental Management's municipal page at adem.alabama.gov slash programs slash water. Now y'all are stormwater set. Well, trying to stop it. Sorry. Do you have any questions? What size are we considered? Are oh, we're we small. small. We're a phase two small. Okay. And I want to kind of give Kim a little credit. You know, what, what happens with all these subdivisions we're approving, there's a pinch of funds, the outfalls, all those things have to be inspected. And last year I went and <laughs> with her and, you know, there's, there's only a couple of cool months and all the briars, you know, died, died back and we didn't go during those months. When, when the reports are in, it's when it's still pretty thick. So, yeah. you know, what they do, and, and I appreciate you and give a nod to Public Works, they're helping out this year. So a lot of, lot of work goes into these requirements. And, when you consider the construction site runoff the most difficult to enforce? The what now? I'm when sorry. When you consider the construction site runoff the most difficult to enforce? Probably the municipal projects. Um, just because we're always on the right of way. They're not difficult to enforce, but I mean, we have, we're probably the biggest industry that's most active. We have a lot of subdivisions going, but we also have a lot of our own projects. Um, anything, we, our topography is challenging in Fairhope, a lot of gullies, so any subdivision that's on, on or near wetlands or a gully are a challenge. So, and everybody's area is a priority area. I've learned that. Whichever watershed you live in, that's the priority area for Fairhope. I think the Calpin Creek is the actual priority one, right? <laughs> That's right. Well, <laughs> depends on where you live. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, good. Anybody have any questions or comments? If not, um, I'd like a motion to approve our uh, storm, water, storm water management program plan. So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Any further discussion? Perfect. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. All right, thank, thank you. Thank you, we'll see Kim. you again next year. You do a great <laughs> job, and you're one of the people that can understand our job. You're not always, right. you know, <laughs> welcomed into people's <laughs> places, but you do it, you really do a good job with what you do. Thank you, Lee. Thank thank you. You. Yeah. Kim and Eric and the Planning and Zoning Commission were not always loved. That's <laughs> right. That's right. 
All right. Um, next item on the agenda is ZC 217, 21.17. Uh, Hunter? Yes, sir. So this was, um, for those that were here in December, we had a conversation with the zone, proposed zoning amendment. Um, and I'm going to, this is the way it would read uh, in brief in the section it's in. I'll get to where we can actually read this. Um, just just kind of touch on a couple of concerns. This is obviously about rooftop <coughs> terraces. And one of those concerns were when they're located atop the first or second floors, they shouldn't be penalized or limited by the same regulations. You know, if they can build a building uh, from lot line to lot line, why should they be limited to a, a coverage of their elevators or structures? Um, the second bullet point there is where the location setbacks of elevators and stairway structures. Uh, and then thirdly, there was a concern about temporary structures such as tents and umbrellas on a 40 foot building and, and being caught with a wind. The language in full is, is below the meat of the language, but and, and how we addressed the, the first item, um, we, we basically added number three there that said four rooftop terraces located atop three story buildings. The following standards shall apply. Next slide, we can delve into those standards. But other than that, it's just reinforcing the height of all structures on or within a rooftop terrace shall not exceed 40 feet. And then the outer boundary of a rooftop terrace shall be defined using a barrier meeting the building code. And what there, that's the safety barrier. You know, so whatever that rail is, we don't want our, you know, good looking designs to conflict with that. We really didn't have to put that in there, but it's just a nice, nice nod as an architecture looking into those. So I'm going to flip to, and I should have give you a prelude, but to the, uh, when we're, when we're working as fast as we are, sometimes we don't have the best graphics. And when you're trying to throw something together about 2.30 this afternoon, you wind up with things like this. <laughs> when you let your kids do your work for you. Yes, uh, I do have a seven-year-old. He has, he's actually much better than I am. I probably should have got him to do this. Um, so what, what we're kind of looking at here is if it's on top of a three-story building, and let's assume that they're building to the front and to both sides, but five foot from the property line, this kind of gives an example of how things can be located, their percentages. We have some setbacks on top of a building. And while we got away from the language we proposed in December was about setbacks from the edge of a building. We just say from a lot line. And what that does for us, because remember, these are only allowed in the B2 within the CBD. So CBD has specific guidelines and allows building to lot lines. Um, you know, the, the, the graphics here kind of show that if your building is 10 foot from the lot line, well, your structure can be right at the edge of the building. So a lot of the things we see that don't have problems in the CBD when people leave room behind the building for their back of house type items, well, they're already gonna be 10 foot off. They sometimes have parking, you know, that's gonna be uh, more in the internal lot. So they, they can, I'm not saying they will, but they can build to the, the lot line. Um, one caveat that I failed to mention, these, stairways and, and elevators we did add a, a segment here or a little snippet here where it shall not be viewed from viewable from public right-of-ways so what that looks like from the street is we still don't want, need them to be back behind the the building but on the second little image there when a building's bit, built right at the property line that structure on the rooftop terrace should, should move back 10 feet off the edge of the building and then just kind of that in between, let's say a building is three foot from the property line. Well, they have to split that difference and move it seven feet. So they got to get that rooftop structure 10 foot away from the property line. So we believe we, we accomplished those by these two changes. And then the fourth change, we just simply said temporary structures such as tents, awnings, umbrellas are prohibited on rooftop terraces. Kind of. Art, you said keep it simple sometimes, and sometimes I'll argue with you that that's not the right approach. But sometimes when you dig into it, you, you get a lot of language and bring it back down to the simple language, and you have to go through that kind of math to get there. So I think ultimately this is more simple. Um, I didn't make any changes to that last line. Rooftop terraces needed a definition. We proposed that in, in Article 9 to add that definition of a rooftop terrace. Um, do want to call out for those that weren't here one thing this is doing for the 
elevator shafts slash stairwells, it is allowing those structures to be at 45 feet in lieu of the 40 feet, but that structure could only um, be made up of seven and a half percent of the total square foot of the building. So that, I think that was the only thing I missed. If there's any questions on this, I'd be happy to answer them. I've got one. I mean, and I've kind of been thinking about this um, a, a little bit. Um, basically, what we're doing is we're just, you know, we changed the height ordinance to 40, and now we're kind of, you know, raising it, kind of through a little back door a little bit more, you know, to give a little bit more here and there, and trying to make some rules so that, you know, we can have it. You know, nobody gets hurt, so what if you can't see it? It just is an attractive rooftop terrace, but trying to keep, you know, whenever you, you know, as Art says, you do for one, you got to do for the others, and so you do this, and, you know, we just forget how, you know, brazen people can be in certain, you know, not everybody cares about how things look to the neighbors, et cetera. You know, my only concern, if you could just go back to the setbacks, and when you're talking about the, you know, KISS system of keeping it simple, mm -hmm. me being stupid. Um, so we just require a 10-foot setback no matter what, rather than getting fancy on if you have a 10-foot setback, you know, for the building, then not require the setback up, up on the roof. Because I'm just wondering, you know, if you've got a building 45 feet tall, a 10-foot setback doesn't seem to add a lot to it and you're still seeing that you know what we're trying to do is minimize that extra height that extra shade you know to where you know you can't see it ultimately if these things you know all your structure and elevator shaft are in the middle and you can't see them and you have a cute little well and people up there then it's just nice and cute we'll all hold our pinkies out but you know you just never know how far people want to push it and developers can be so creative and in, in good ways and also sometimes and you know, ways in that you open kind of Pandora's box. And so I'm just wondering, do you, do you think that that... Yeah, round, that's, the, that's think, kind of the way we proposed it. Are you pretty comfortable? Because if you are, you know, I'll, you know, I'll pick my battles. If you're pretty comfortable with the setback on the ground level accomplishing what we're trying to do, I'm fine with it. But I just wonder if we ought to require the 10-foot regardless of what you do on the ground level. So... You know, we, we proposed the, the 10 foot from the building and then we kind of went round and round about what we can do. We sat down and looked at a, tons of options and how it might impact. And for this revision, I believe this is the, the right way to go. Um, I will tell you one of my, and there's no clean way we would allow these in B2. I, I will probably propose an amendment in the, in the future that would send this to a Board of Adjustment for approval. Um, I believe it's that important. Uh, sometimes the locations of these, you know, we're in, we're in this, we just had a moratorium. We all know the volume we're dealing with. So it's hard to, to give. And we also had a zone, a capsule class. I'm gonna re reiterate one of the points that was made in that class. You know, when we're only reviewing development plans and projects, then, then what we're doing is broken. Because this is the kind of stuff that is planning, it's what we should be looking at, right. and you know, divesting you know, some of our time to both of those. So, you know, I, I, I think if we're looking, and what, I, the, the, what I'm hearing is true, or form-based codes are our future, and we, we, I think it's, hard to, it's hard, hard to halfway do it. And if we're gonna halfway do it, I think we're there. I think what we proposed is working, but I think we need to revisit it. I don't think we need to just leave this alone um, with the with everything we got within the comp plan. I believe we can propose something that will address those concerns. But in the short term, this was a request and an issue, so I think we've got a solution. Sure, and we may, if we look at the future, we may want to bring it outside of just the central business district. You know, mm -hmm. somebody in one of the. B3Bs might want a rooftop terrace looking at the bay or something. Yep. I think you're, I think you're out spot on there. Um, Any other questions for Hunter before I open the public? Oh, what is, uh, give me an, uh, an example of a structure other than an elevator. 
that there would be up there. A I mean, bar. I, I did a couple of buildings, and so we and talked about this a little bit. And you asked the question, didn't we? We didn't know exactly the answer. I'll give you an example um, from re in a reality, reality situation that the project's probably dead. Uh, it's got to be because we purchased part of the land. But the little boutique hotel that was on the corner of Section and Fairhope, right there by the clock corner. When that came in, um, and, and Eric was involved in this one as well, they looked at doing a roof on the rooftop there. So they had the bar had to have a cover on it there was some health department concerns there they want a shade structure pergola you know they, they can put and i believe we say whether it's walled or unwalled but it's limited to 33 percent so if they've got storage up there where they're not you know carrying plates or i don't i don't know you know what whatever materials are they've got a storage room a bar and a shade structure for rain that's people sitting up there that would be allowed kind of sounds like another floor doesn't it it does but for the purposes of the zoning and and it will be for the purpose of building code for the purpose of the zoning ordinance we're saying no but it's because it's limited to 33 percent it is outdoor um it i mean that's kind of the intent of the definition to say what describe what it is um and i think john had a good point last month where the rooftop terrace is more that outdoor space um it could be but is it intended to be is it intended to be a food service drinking drinking and drinking place uh, potentially instead of it's, just it's a, accessory just use it can't be a standalone so the way we define this and why it was hard to go back to that conditional well, wait, 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 use what do you call them a standalone um it, it cannot so if if i own a building I can't and just want to operate the first three fours. I can't rent out to you to run an independent bar on okay. the top of the roof. Okay. It can. It's got to be accessory to the main use of the property. So if I own a hotel, I can have a, you know, little speakeasy on the roof. Or if I own an, a, a mixed use building with commercial on the ground floor apartments, I can have a space for the apartment residents to enjoy. They can gonna get into it when they start putting bands up there. Oh, well, I've thought about that. With a noise. <laughs> yeah. Well, we do have a noise ordinance. Well, that, yeah. Well, I, we can we can all think about two or three that have uh, uh, legally been cities been involved with those before. The first little graphic that you that you drew here. Mm -hmm. There's just something about having. I mean, you've got it. Maybe it'll never happen, but you've got that structure on that right at the edge of the building mm -hmm. I, I, th I think you're right I don't think it'll ever happen people are gonna have to have parapet happen, walls they're gonna have to but do if something. it does yeah. what does that do to to eliminate the uh, the visibility of uh, of uh, something up there uh, I, I mean I, I would think an architect would be creative in how they would do that if a parapet wall for example would give the height you know you could actually have a peak there that, that could be masked and hidden I, you know th this is saying what's allowed in this I, I have no opposition if we want to say but in no case it has to be five feet from the edge of the building well I mean look at the one look at the second one and even the third one but mm -hmm. when you when you move it back and you're down on the sidewalk and you're looking up yeah okay you can't see those but if your structure is right on the edge of the building so what we're what from we're doing from a safety then? standpoint and from a we we did we did them in mobile yeah i did a couple of buildings in mobile and Bimble square but we never had them right up at the edge of the building so the the catch there is we're saying in another way they're not viewable from the right away so you can't see it from the sidewalk you can't see it from the street that's, that's going to force that to so be located in well you can't see that you can't see that one i don't care so, where you are yeah, I mean, so they couldn't do that in other words I, yeah. I i was thinking the same exact thing you were of, they just built here and they're just going up on the wall but another place in it says you can't see it from a right of way yeah so, so in other words, what you're telling well okay so look at the, the okay the, i'm with thank you for that so so, so but what you're saying is then that so the, the rear neighbor not, the rear you, neighbor you, might get screwed but it would look pretty from the sidewalk. You drew, you drew it, but it's not going to be built. No, it could be built on the. Roof. That could be on the back side of the building. No, I didn't say which the one's the. Okay, like I'm assuming up. this is all the front of the building. Then you. Yeah. No. 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 That. 
That's my crayon drawings. There's no right of way posed here or anything I'm gonna else. I'll call your son and tell him to overlook your I drawings. need some tutorials, that's for sure. Um, okay. But, but yeah, there, there's, and, and I do want to say, you know, show this. So what, what in reality would happen here, they can't build a 40 foot building and then put a stairwell and elevator shaft in. Depending on what kind of equipment they need, they're gonna need eight to 10 feet minimum to provide that headroom and elevator equipment. Um, so the, the roof of the, what you would be standing on would have to be 35, 34, 36, somewhere in that, you know, to, to get that. So in, in effect, it kind of lowers the, the roof in this situation. Now the parapet wall could go up to 40 feet. All the structures you're talking about under the 33 feet, the bar, all that, all that has to be under 30 feet or 40 feet. So the only allowance going to that 45 is the, the stairwell. And, and we had that happen and come up at the boutique hotel at, at, on the corner. And actually that site plan was approved with that. And the interpretations that time that started, that's kind of where the 40 foot came into play and just capping all everything at 40 feet. All right, well, thank, you. thank you, Hunter. Yes, um, I'll go ahead and open the public hearing at this time. Does anybody from the public wish to speak to Z ZC 21.17, um, an ordinance that, again, we, we don't have ordinance authority, so we'll simply make a recommendation to the city council that will either uh, approve or not approve the ordinance. Does anybody wish to speak to this item? All right, I'll close the public hearing. Motion, Mr. Chairman. Well, Chris, do you, are you, uh, you seemed awfully interested all of a sudden. Are you, you cool with this? Yes, sir. Okay, and Eric, <laughs> everything's all right with you. <laughs> okay, You're not throwing spitballs at me. Well, we tried to we tried to accomplish some of the requests and the concerns that were raised at the last planning commission meetings. We want to take all the commissioners' comments into account in this latest version. So. Okay, and I talked to Rebecca about this. She sent a long text and seems to she put a lot of thought into it as well. But she's more concerned about you know wondering about doing it outside of the central business district if we do start you know, kind of let the um, Board of Adjustments be kind of an overview group. All right. Okay. Uh, uh, case ZC21.17, I move that we recommend the City Council approval. I have a second. motion. And a second. <clears throat> who, who are we going to put down as the second on that? Put down. Okay. Got it down there. All right. Um, got a motion and a second. Put Jason down. I'll use the second, if you will, on that. Uh, any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. All right, motion passes unanimously. Next item, ZC 22.01. I'm back. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give a quick apology to our utility folks back here. We have tried to get them at the front of the agenda, but we had some other things going on tonight, so they get the long show tonight. Um, we'll get the as we can. Uh, this is another amendment. This actually started from the um, a Board of Adjustment. So I'll, I'm going to quick, quickly show our dimension table for residential accessory structures. Uh, down there at the end, we have some stipulations for reg, uh, agriculture and uh, R3PGH, which is deprecated at this time, but still have some of those used. But all other residential districts for the height limit of an accessory structure is 30 feet but no taller than the principal structure so what i will kind of give you the story of what the board of adjustments has been challenged with in the past they've given variances for that when somebody comes in and has a historic structure it's a one-story structure they've given variances to allow the accessory structure to be taller it's got a history there well what happens in uh in all of our worlds, case law kind of dictates interpretations. And it's been clear through case law that you can't do that with a variance. Where well, the hardship is about the land. It's not about what sits on that land that we create as, as man and woman. We build on top of the land. Because there's a building here that doesn't allow me to do what I want to do. It's a hardship. Or it's a bare land and my house plans don't fit on that. It's a hardship. So. Um, the challenge they're faced with, and there are some situations I can say it kind of makes sense, 
is when it's it's as common in the fruit and nut district we don't have an overlay district there so this would have to be an amendment to that would apply to anything um, procedurally want to show you and then I can kind of give you what uh, what our solution is just want to make a note of this we did advertise this as a, an amendment to article 2 in the zoning ordinance that's procedures of the Board of Adjustment we were actually at looking at adding another item they can review things under we kind of after digging that we got to advertise you know two and a half weeks of, of before this meeting and <coughs> since then we've kind of looked at another solution that we think accomplishes the same goal but does it much more simple um, so it is an amendment to article 3 since this does go to the board uh, to the city council for final approval we have to advertise this two more times in the paper we will advertise that properly uh, to for the article 3 if if it gets out of Planning Commission with a recommendation tonight so what we've done there we've get requests somebody wanting to preserve a historic home that is a single story for lack of a better description uh, could be two very short building uh, <coughs> floors but and they want to put in a garage where there maybe was carport maybe there was nothing in the rear yard and want to go slightly above the, the existing height of the house and we're not talking about towering over they're limited by the size 25 percent of the rear yard so this would only apply to those accessory structures but in those situations where they may be a few feet above is there a streamlined solution and what we're proposing here and I'll read this and while we even in this footnote put the attempt to preserve the historic one structure one story structures on lots where the pr principal stru stru structure is one story an administrative approval may be given to allow an accessory structure to be taller than the principal structure but in no case more than five feet taller and that is describing how the measurement is so from the peak of the roof of the principal structure excluding chimneys coplas spires other architectural features in no case shall an accessory structure exceed 30 feet I made that little amendment since you've seen since we sent out the packets because some of the districts have a height limit of 35 feet all accessory structures are limited to 30 feet so nothing should be above above that I've taken taken a picture from Google it's nowhere near us but just to show an example here in this fictional example if the building were 27 the building was 27 feet and someone wanted to do a an accessory structure behind that is illustrated in the red hatched area well five feet would allow them 35 foot I'm mean, sorry 32 feet do my math right um, but however I need to go the seven-year-old again uh, <laughs> the but because there's that 30 foot 30 foot cap you know 30 foot is what they would be allowed to do so three foot taller than the build building principal building on site so we think this scales pretty well in solutions uh in in different uh, scenarios that we're looking at um of course if somebody builds tears down a house or builds their house uh, with adds a second story onto the house this would not be needed they can go to 30 feet and um there there's no need for this so uh one thing i didn't include in here maybe something we want to discuss is where that might have to have a minimum pitch maybe that pitch has to meet the pitch of the the principal structure you know for some of those architectural details um but that that's that's the proposal we have uh, i want you to kind of understand the what we're trying to solve as well and, and maybe we don't solve it maybe meet the ordinance I do think there will be some you know challenges where people are, have purchased a historic home they like the house they can get enough square footage by adding a second story on the accessory if they can't do that they're more likely to to either tear down or you know fix you know do something to the house and that's that's a solution viable solution too All right. Any questions for staff? In that case, I'll go ahead and open the public hearing. Anybody wish to speak to ZC um, 2201? If not, I'll close the public hearings. Members? 
What do you think down that cloud race? I think we should approve this. I don't know what the numbers are. Twenty two zero one. All right. I've got a motion that we recommend approval to the city council. Do I have a second? Second. Uh, any further? All in favor say aye. 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 Any uh, any opposed? Passes unanimously. All right. Next item on the agenda. Uh -oh, is. Oh, here he comes. Yeah. Boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> SD 21.49, <laughs> Old Battles Village, Phase 4B. Couldn't let Hunter have all the fun. So this is Old Battles Village 4B. I'm Mike Jeffries with the City of Fairhoop. This is for a final plat approval of SD 21.49. Uh, Dewberry is the authorized agent and engineer record and is with us tonight. As it is for a 19 lot subdivision located at the east terminus of MacArthur Lane, which is south of Old Battles Village, Phase 3. Uh, the property is currently zoned a PUD, which has a site plan that 4B had to be built with in substantial conformance to, and also a preliminary plat that was approved January 3rd, 2017. Uh, the preliminary approval was for phase four. It has been split into 4A and 4B. 4A has already received final plat approval, and this is the other half of four for final plat approval tonight. On the screen, you can see on the left is our zoning map. That blue aqua color is our PUD, or planned unit development. On the right is the aerial. This is an image of the plat. North is to the right. It's not up on your screen. Uh, the 19 lots depicting there, you can see where it connects to the two streets of the existing Old Battles Village Phase 3. Site data again, zone PUD, uh, setbacks, building height of 30 feet, your front and rear 30 and 25 with the traditional 10 foot side and 20 foot street side. The final plat must be recorded within 60 days after the date of approval. Uh, this subdivision has been built and designed in conformance with both the approved preliminary plat and the PUD site plan. Uh, some follow activities that are always required with a final plat is to provide a copy of the recorded plat, a copy of the recorded O&M agreement, and the maintenance and guarantee agreement which covers uh, the bonding of the roads and infrastructure that has been um, installed inside of the development is an agreement by the developer that the mayor signs uh, to execute it. Uh, staff's recommendation is approval of SD 2149 Old Battles Village 4B uh, with conditions. One is final stabilization of all disturbed areas with 90% growth, growth verified by the planning department. Provide an amended o &M agreement for Old Battle Village Phase 3 that includes 4B. And three is to simply complete the required activities that was listed in the staff report. And on behalf of staff, be happy to answer any questions that you have. And again, Justin Britt with Dewberry is with us tonight, and he'd be happy to answer any questions on behalf of the applicant. All right. Any questions for staff at this time? Nope. All right. And Mr. We did receive some communication. You either received those in your packet or via email. Okay. From um, the anybody from the uh, developer wish to speak to this item? Okay, um, I'll go ahead and open the public hearing at this time. Does anybody from the public wish to speak to this? Good evening. My name is Bob Roberts. I live at 291 Old, um, Garrison Boulevard in the Old Ballas Village area. Uh, we back up to this area that they're developing or have put the roads in so far. Before the road was put in, I called the city, I called the horticulturist, and I talked, I, I, uh, talked to the mayor, and I, exp I expressed my, uh, un uh, let's say, my dissatisfaction with the cutting of the trees. They took down multiple trees that were absolutely gorgeous. Um, and after all of my discussion with these people at my home and backyard, my wife took pictures I didn't bring with me tonight, I found out that uh, Trulin has the ability to do whatever they want until it's transferred to the Homeowners Association. So we got stuck with trash trees. We still, and by the way, the horticulturist came out and stated that any tree that is 20 inches in diameter or larger were not to be cut. And I can tell you, they cut them down without even thinking about it. 
I even talked about, well, how, can they leave some of the trees between the homes that are being built? No. If you look in the older parts of our neighborhood, I'm saying older, three, five, seven years old, there are trees that were left between properties, and uh, I don't understand this. And I know the developers have a lot of power. The city is adamant about certain things, but yet when it comes to doing something like this, I think it's a shame. Uh, it's just unfortunate that they're allowed to get away with this. And um, if this was any other situation, I came from an area where it was, I was a builder. And I know I came from Madison, Mississippi. And there's not a tougher mayor that I've ever dealt with. And when she said something was going to be done, it was going to be done. And this just doesn't allow for any discussion at all. And I think it should be changed in your ordinances that if before um, anybody cuts anything down, that the city has to come in and approve it and mark those trees accordingly. So that's all I have to say. I just think it's a, a lousy deal if you want to see the bottom line. Yeah. Yeah, we don't have a tree ordinance residential. We do. Really. I mean, but. Well, just every subdivision that comes in, there's a tree survey. Right. And we look at those, and they, if they do taking trees down, they have to supply, you know, greater with the tree credits and what's done. Um, you know, so I, I think all the things that we're talking about have been done, have been reviewed. There is one tree that's on private property. Do you remember which lot that was? There is one that actually our horticulture, even the developers are going, hey, that's a beautiful tree. We have no, we need no regulations because it's on a private lot. So we might want to, I can't remember which, which one it is, but it's up by the detention pond. Yes, uh, that you know would be great if we can save. So I would like to ask the engineer of record here if they can work on that a plat. You know if there's any way to protect that one tree, even though it's on private property. I believe it's in the rear yard, not in the buildable area. But if you can get you know check on that, see if we can. I think being right there in the common area, close to the common area of the detention pond, would be great. You know when when our horse, I believe it was 201. I think, yeah, it's... Wait a minute, isn't our tree, doesn't a tree ordinance, doesn't our tree ordinance stipulate that they, they, they've got to remediate any of the tree, 20 inches or whatever the number is, and larger? Yes. When so it's, what, when so it's what in is a, the, what's... Well, it's in the right of way, but well, when I said we don't have a, you know, tree ordinance for residential, I mean in people's residential lots, we don't right. have a tree ordinance. Yeah, and, but, I mean, but in terms of... There, and I've, I wasn't here, but I've talked to you know to a lot of people that were in it, and that's that's always been a great source of debate. You know, where do you protect trees? We protect uh, on on res on commercial on right of ways, but when you start telling private property owners what they can do on their residential property, that that gets another level, and we don't have protections on those. Okay. Well, let's I'm sorry. Go ahead, please. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So um, I I feel bad for the trees because I mm -hmm. like trees. Mm -hmm. But why can't we, um, if there is a tree that is, say, in this development, we do have people come out, they measure them for 20 inches, what have you. Mm -hmm. um, why can't we rewrite something to protect those trees regardless? I mean, yeah, it's your private. It's their, if, if you don't like the rules, give them a lot. Yeah. If you don't like the rule of what we say about that tree on that lot, then that lot. Yeah. Um, the de I mean, I just, I feel, I like uh, trees. <laughs> yeah. So that's, I just don't understand. Like some, like, I understand what he's saying. I, my heart yeah. goes out to him. But um, I do feel like we need to do something about that. Because when you do have beautiful trees, that is appealing, you know, to that location. And then you have them, a developer to come in to say, Oh, we can't do that. The road can't go here because of the tree. It go around the tree. Yeah. It's actually there. So why can't we deem it necessary to keep those things instead of oh, for every one tree you cut down, you put up twenty little bitty trees that I'll never see them grow to this size. Right. I mean, I just made that up. But yeah. Are that you referring to happen. private it does. private property if lot owners? Well, if it's in a development and the developer is coming in to say clear the lot so that you know they can um, put a home there. 
you know, do we have a say at that time, you know? When most of the time we don't, a, we don't, we actually, we, we do review those things. We try to mitigate those as much as possible on their roads. Now, this was a different scenario because this PUD was approved many years before this, this phase. Okay. So the layout of the roads and all were, were kind of done at that point in time. Mm -hmm. um, and, but we do that quite frequently. The challenge is once, if there are trees preserved on that lot, well, when they come in and uh, some private, some person, I buy it or you buy it, well, there's no protection on cutting that tree down then. Yes, but if you're a developer, uh, yeah. okay. So well, then my, my <laughs> thought, my thought, Clarice, is, and, and I'm, I'm going to go hug some trees. And I, and I really, <laughs> I understand, and I'm all about trees being in the forestry business, but, but the problem comes in to, especially for private lots, private ownership, where you come in and bought a lot, you want to put a house, you got a plan, the tree is in the tree is in the way, and so we're going to tell them they can't they can't cut it down. We're going to then we're going to end up having uh, when you and I are long or do and gone, somebody going to tell them what color they can paint their house and how many windows they can have and and uh, how much grass they can put in the front. I mean, you see, I know it goes extreme, but it's it's. It's getting, yeah. getting it's back to the trees. From the beginning, we get a tree survey that shows the diameter of the trees. Our horticulturalist looks at it, and there's often times before it makes it to here that we requested the engineer, the applicant, it redesigns and moves lot lines to either put one of those trees on a lot line or into common area to try to remedy and minimize the effect of the trees that are getting lost that are 20 inches. Typically, if it's a 50 inch or a 60 inch tree that they're wiping out, we will recommend and make them. But what happened redesign in this it before it gets developed like Hunter said this was this original before. design was in 2005 when this PUD was approved so what's was, like the time span because it I mean shouldn't there be like a window of um, okay um, like we don't have like a, 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 a well, wouldn't that come up in a subdivision anyway? I think that's what Clarice is saying. That, yeah, you know, like the PUD was approved back then, but then yeah. you but you're know, building now, so but you need now, to be now we're looking at the subdivision, so it shouldn't be looked at now. Yeah, and, and I, I think that's a there's a couple of ways to handle that. With all these are conversations we've been having internally when we can get to that, you know, in the comp plan and what we how we amend the regulations. One of the I think the best things we can do right now, a lot of the plans you see only shows grading in the li within the limits of the common area and right of ways. So the home builder then comes in and has to grade, you know, to fit a house in. So, you know, if if during development the limits of grading are just at the right of way, well, you might have to move six feet, you know cut out six feet or put six feet in, which any tree on that site, that one lot is not gonna happen. So a, a true evaluation on what trees you can save would be requiring the grading of the whole site. That helps utilities and some other areas. There's a flip side to that, you know, and, and how we, we kind of mitigate those things. So I think then we can actually evaluate what trees are being, truly being saved and are they inside the area of where a house is? You know, can we change lots then? It's hard to evaluate with it right now. Well, it's it's hard to also get it on individual private property lots. You know, I did a mm -hmm. subdivision with my parents on our, some of our family land. Mm -hmm. And we, you know, a small subdivision with 18 lots. And we only, in the subdivision rates, you can only cut trees down where your footprint was of your house and no others. Well, turned out in that soldier vision there were a lot of slash pines so you know the insurance companies and the owners were all concerned about the, all these yeah. you know pines being around there so we ended up you know having to back up on that subdivision regulation just because you know people wanted to sleep at night and so you know we allowed the slash pines to be cut but then they had to plant you know a long leaf pine which is you know until Hurricane Sally came through my yard and I don't know how that was a category two with 141 mile an hour winds with my long leaf pines at 45 degree angles and a couple on the ground and magnolias and live oaks but basically we we allowed them to replace live oaks and magnolias and and long leaf pines that before Sally came through Fish River I would have told you usually handle hurricanes pretty well um, yeah so you know we've but, got but that is we've concern. got some streets within the municipality 
I can't remember. It's, it's an extension of Bishop. I think it's an extension of Bishop Road going south. Troyer Booth. Yeah. Huh? Booth. 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 The road goes around Booth. the tree. Right. And yeah. the road. And yeah. there's two. Around. There's two places on yeah. that road where the. They did a great job. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they really did. And you talk about a traffic calming device, but at the same time. <laughs> they're stopping, yeah. Um, that's because single tax corporation paid for that road. Well, thanks. Could you pay for Not a developer. If, yeah. if, if individuals do it, it's going to go straight. Or if the city or county does it, it goes straight. But well, the county and the city are going to make it go straight because that's in, in most and most engineers are going to yeah. make it go straight because that's the most inexpensive way to do it. Yeah, Leslie State. It sounds like this one. Has that road already been cut? Yeah. Road already been cut through. It's, it's, yeah. it's final plat. Yeah, it's final plat. All right. I do want to mention one other thing, and this is more for um, engineer and and kind of just something we the the condition two here where the O and M agreement for Old Bells Village Phase Three needs to include four B. That's going to be a challenge if we don't have four A. Um, recorded because we've we've approved final plat of 4a so long ago and that was in sidewalks were installed there we're still waiting on the bonds and the closeout procedures to take that so that that's kind of a it's gonna be difficult to handle one without you know leapfrogging one there so just a prompt to to get an answer for some of those how homes are being built there and eventually if we don't have that resolved and we're gonna to have to tell people they can't move into a home because they're not on a public street. So wanna to, wanna to just prompt to get an answer for that one. Thank you. Allie, have I closed the public hearing yet? You know, I don't think I have, have I? Any anybody else who wish to speak to this item? If if not, I'll close the public hearing. Um I've got one question on this and I know this we is do a you have someone chair. Sorry? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were getting it. Yes, sir. Okay. I'm Bob Whitfield, 287 Garrison Boulevard. And I think you all have a letter in your pack, supposedly. Uh, I read written an email last week. We received our certified letter at 1 o'clock on Christmas Eve stating that anything we had to report to you had to be in by 12 o'clock noon, which made it a little bit difficult. Um, we purchased the house a year and a half ago uh, with the because of the trees in the backyard, uh, we came from wooded areas, and this was this was no at no point was it ever mentioned that there would be any development behind us, uh, which was one of the selling points for us was to have, to have the trees there. Uh, now they have come through and start talking about they started cutting the road. I've talked, uh, written several letters to uh, the Trulin people, the builders there. They have chosen not to respond to any of that. Um, and I'm just uh, would like to see as many trees as possible left there. I know that if you look at the picture they showed, it looks like about three fourths to 80 percent uh, is wooded. Uh, that's going to be major, major destruction of trees in order to put any of the homes in there. Try to squeeze 19 homes in that area. Um, so I'm obviously opposed to it and disappointed that it's going that direction uh, where if they take those trees out we've we've added a nice sunroom so we have a quiet backyard now we're going to have looking at two other houses and I'm not sure what's on the other side maybe public public shopping center as far as I know the new shopping center so it's going to be the, the light and the noise and all the other things that are going to happening from that so um, anyway I'm just disgruntled with that and opposed to uh, having that done. Thank you, sir. Yeah, this is a final plot approval, right? It so is. Done with the and I do, you know, I do sympathize, and, and we see this a lot at staff level where people were kind of told that there's going to be woods there, there's going to be, and and y'all and y'all know this, the real, real estate in Alabama is there's no consequences. You can say anything you want for the most part. Um, but this has been approved many years ago. Anybody that looks, you know, we, we had in another phase someone that said the same thing. This is not a surprise. This has got a PUD and multi this is that, I believe this is the last phase? Phase six is the last phase of, and, and four was split into two. So th th this is, 
unfortunately it's we know this y'all seen these it's public record it's every you know recorded in multiple phases it's no secret but you know sometimes people are not informed when they purchase a home and there's no requirement to do that I, i'm sympathetic but again it's, it's a challenge to because this has also been approved the, the proper appropriate ways i've got one question for the engineer if you don't mind and this is i'm asking for a personal reason right there where pell moon court is i'll, I'll, little, try, I'll try my best Lee, do you want to close, close the public hearing? hearing oh yeah i'd like to close the public hearing now thank you um the little dot in the middle of the public pell moon court is my son's uh house where we just did some grading work because water got in uh part of his house so under that i think they had about a 11 inch rain in about 45 minutes at his house and it barely rained at mine but the water on that back line does it flow north or south could could you show me that let's go back where at Lee? yeah on Lee, the I'm, jason is actually the engineer of record okay for this i was one just one saying where you say the common area slash drainage mm -hmm. does the which do you know which way the water flows on that i do not okay I'm sorry. i mean i can i can go out there and look and just drive out unless there. you have the topography on this one well, you don't have a I don't mean to be slowing the meeting down. No, yeah, I'm just, and I'm sorry. I'm no, I was curious why here. you were here. I can tell you real quick. Retention pond in the north and one at the south. Yeah. Yeah. Looks like it flows to the southeast. Common area. And that's why we're those, uh, these uh, phase no one in plans because there might be a detention pond in another phase that is draining right. to. And we're making sure those maintenance plans are uh, Everybody that's in those spaces are have a stake in the maintenance. Mm -hmm. All right, commissioners. Any further questions for staff or the developer? If not, I'll accept a motion. I move we approve SD 21.49 Old Baptist Village Phase 4 B, B with staff recommendations. I've got a motion to approve subject to staff recommend recommendations. Do I have a second? Second. Any further? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. All right, next item on the agenda, UR2201, a request from C Spire for 2,676 linear feet of optic cable. So you said it's a request for C Spire for utility review. Uh, we've seen several of these the last, last few months. This is for 2,676 feet of buried cable along the following routes uh, primarily uh, this work is going to be going down Bishop and Edwards this is more of a commercial drop um, to supply the Homestead Village cool. staff's recommendation is for approval for UR 22.01 subject to the following conditions um, and most of these conditions are standard conditions um, I'll go through them quickly it kind of outlines uh, what's going to be required moving forward for permitting one is it go through them all the the biggest the uh, condition number seven I'll draw your attention to is to ensure there's enough space for the proposed work available within the existing easement uh, if not the applicants responsible for either expanding existing existing easements or acquiring additional easement and some of this work will be done in the city's right-of-way uh, other portions of this work are proposed to be on private property there is a portion of the property that has an existing easement uh, so we are tasking the uh, applicants to make sure that there is enough room and if not to acquire the needed uh, expansion of that easement and I do believe I saw an e email late today that that has actually already occurred that the additional right of way or additional easements on that property has been um, has been insured and I believe with us tonight 
possibly, maybe not. Uh, nope, not they are not. Nope. That's the other one. The other one through six are our typical conditions um, that mostly pertain to our pre-construction meeting and some of the responsibilities of the applicant themselves. You might correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't also a portion of that in the county right away that we're not we're showing that for correct purposes, showing the whole run, but. Obviously, we're not reviewing that in, in the county right away. Anything that's in the county right away will require permitting through Baldwin County Highway Department. Okay. Uh, and on behalf of staff, happy to answer any questions. All right, anybody oh, here? Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Anybody here on behalf of C Spire? All right, nobody in the public wishes to speak to this. It's not a public hearing. In that case, uh, motion, Mr. Chairman. Chairman. Got a motion to approve subject to staff recommendations. Do I have yeah, a second? <laughs> Did I say that? Second. Uh, that. We'll give Clarice a second. And uh, any further discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed say nay. Motion passed unanimously. Next item is UR 2202, request to appoint broadband for an 11.5211 of 20,086 <laughs> linear feet uh, going throughout Fairfield, Play Subdivision, and Destrahan. Thank you. Uh, as you said, 20, a little over 29,000 feet of buried cable, DSJAN subdivision, River Oak subdivision, and Fairfield subdivision. As you can see outlined on the maps here, River Oaks and Estrahan are uh, interconnected neighborhoods on the left off of Booth Road, and Fairfield is a little further south off of Booth Road on the right-hand map. Again, standard uh, conditions, staff recommends approval of UR 22.02, .02, subject to the following conditions, one through six that are listed as the general, uh, general comments. And they are with us tonight, if you have any particular questions uh, for Point Brabant. All right, thank you. Uh, do you all have anything to add? Good. Yes, no? Okay. <laughs> I've been sitting here a long time for that then. Well, and it, I'm going to ask a question, Lee, and sorry. Yeah. I know he won't go home. But an email did come through this, this afternoon, and there was a question. When we're seeing these fiber, there's pedestals being posted, you know, in some er some areas. And, and that's a lot of the concerns from our residents of what it's going to look like. So they love having fiber but not pedestals. And I believe the question was what pedestals are going to be provided. An email did come through. And I believe the question was, was there an option without having that above ground utility? Um, it appears Point Broadband is actually using a pedestal for 10 to 20 uh, customers as, as in lieu of, as opposed to one to two. But I'd still like to know if there's an option that can be buried. Um, and, and we can answer that. I think that relieves most, much of the concerns of our residents. Because while it's in the right of way or an easement, it's still people's perceived front yards. Sure. So, is, is that an option, or can you explore that option? We can. We can definitely explore. Okay. Um, it, we do it. Uh, there's a couple reasons. We can look up. Yeah. Sorry. This is getting microphone. <laughs> um, we do it for a couple reasons. We we want a vertical structure for our service technicians and our installation technicians. Um, Vaults or handholds tend to get covered up over time, and then the next thing you know, we're digging in somebody's yard that's already manicured. So we, we like the vertical structure now because it offers us that for the service technicians and the installation techs. It also gives us a, a below ground handhold. So it gives us the best of both worlds in those locations. We do use them, uh, I would say, very sparingly, um, 10 to 20 homes. We try to push to the 20 side if we can. We always we, we can't always do that, but we can definitely explore off flush mount. How tall are they? Uh, 19 inches. That all? 19 inches. They are dark green. Um, they have a base that's flush with the ground, and then we go down about 18 to 24 inches. So it gives us that vault or that handhold location. So they're about 19 inches tall, about 10 inches wide or round. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. All right. Um, commissioners? Mo uh, I move that we approve case UR 2202 uh, point broadband. What? Um, and they can uh, research whether they can put some of them under the ground 
Um, Subject to staff recommendations. With staff recommendations. All right. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Any further? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Aye. All right. Thank you all for coming in. Y'all can, right. can research it. Figure it out. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. Old and new business. Uh, we've already done 19.06. How about 21.46? The states of the Brandis Phase 1 request for a 30-day extension of plat approval to obtain final signatures to record the plat. Easy request. Uh, we record with that. We, we support. Yeah. We're, we're, we're good with it there. Also right. getting approval through Baldwin County. So they're at requesting an extension to allow for their approval and be able to get all the signatures required. Do I have a motion for an extension? I move we grant the extension. Do I have a second? Second. Uh, put Harry down for the second. Any further? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. All right. Um, we have been requested, the city has passed a 12 month uh, moratorium on subdivisions. Chris, would you like to explain why you think that, why you like us to do this? Certainly. So obviously the planning commission has the purview over subdivision, uh, you know, under the subdivision regulations. The city, through the city council under the police powers, has the legal authority to enact a moratorium uh, with limited, you know, scope and, and specific parameters, which city council has now passed and enacted. But in terms of uh, the Planning Commission's perspective on it, uh, I think just for a, you know, appearance of, if you do support it, uh, just more of a ceremonial position, but also from a legal standpoint, I think it solidifies the moratorium in the event, the, you know, the possibility of someone trying to challenge the moratorium ordinance itself. I think it further strengthens uh, the city's and obviously the Planning Commission's perspective on enforcement of the moratorium gives further credence and support to staff to uh, stand behind the moratorium for subdivision applications and MOP applications that are subject to the moratorium. And if, if you have any specific questions about the moratorium, just briefly, it's a 12-month moratorium period on subdivision and multiple occupancy project applications outside of the city limits but within the planning jurisdiction of the city of Fairhope. What did Explain that for me, because I'm a little confused now. Why, why out just outside the city limits? Yeah, and that was a council and, and staff discussion. I mean, obviously that's not a legal question, but well, from a from a general standpoint, most of the the concern and the growth and a lot of the applications that have come before this commission have been unzoned Baldwin County outside of the city limits, um, with new large multi-phase subdivisions coming about, and so. The question, you know, in terms of inside the city limits, obviously there's zoning in place already. Um, a lot of it's, I mean, I'm not going to say it's completely built out, but a lot of it is there's stuff there or approval there. Um, and the, the areas of exponential growth seem to be in the Planning Commission, historically looking over the projects that are becoming for y'all has been right on the fringe and outside the city okay. limits, the, but in the, the planning jurisdiction. So I'm a landowner and I've got 200 acres on the fringe of the city, the city, it's in the county. And it's in the extraterritorial jurisdiction. So I come to the city and I say, hmm, I don't want to wait 12 months. So I want to annex in. And now all of a sudden I get annexed in and I can do whatever I want. The ordinance specifically addresses that it does. issue. It so does. Anybody that annexes in within, this, where does within it the suggest, period of this where does it? What you have before you is a resolution of the Planning Commission adopting what the city council. Okay, then, then just explain that to me. There's, there's verbiage in the resolute, not in the resolution, in the, in the ordinance itself, the moratorium will preclude someone from annexing to the city? No, the moratorium would, the, the moratorium would apply if they annex into the city during the period of the moratorium. They can annex They in. can annex in, but they will be subject to the moratorium. They can't loophole or backdoor and say, we're in the city, now it doesn't apply for us. Specifically says, but if somebody wants to come in and annex and get annex propose, in. propose, nobody's going to do it to, you know, but somebody wanted to annex in, you know, for 40 acres and say we want to be R2, we'd review that zoning quest, but they couldn't move forward into preliminary plat under the moratorium. 
Uh, a lot of this is, you know, for utilities and kind of getting that, you know, getting the breadth and getting ahead of the curve on some of that. If you look at inside the city limits of what we look at month in, month out, it's, you know, multiple occupancy projects in downtown and some of those areas that, you know, trigger the multi, you know, the mop due to the fact of the amount of square footage and some little minor two and three lot subdivisions. I mean, everything else is pretty much out of the city limits. Well, in the case tonight. And I mean, a lot of the stuff, even that you think is in the city. We have, we have them. I mean, we have them. Well, and let me be clear. Wait, wait, what, what was, what tonight was in the city? Well, we had one that was on the R2. We Old Wells Village and River Horse. Yeah, but that River Horse was out of the city River limits Horse. when it was done. It was, what? it was yeah. out of the city limits when we originally approved it three well, years ago. No, it, 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 it had a zoning. I'm just saying it's in the, it, 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 it was right in the city point. limits. Right. But, it was, but, it was R2. I, I'm just saying almost everything that we see is, I mean, even the one old Battles Village was out of the city limits when it was originally approved. And to be clear, anything that has received approval or certain, there are certain circumstances that are spelled out in the ordinance itself, this moratorium does not apply yeah. to those projects. Which is 30, 38. I'm just wondering how much, y'all feel like it's gonna cut you a bunch of slack? Oh, well, I mean, I don't think we'll see a, a blip on our radar until March. February, right. maybe after February, but probably March, and then we'll, we we will not slow down. We have a lot of work to do to make amendment, propose amendments, do the research, do these things. So, it, it will be a less of reviewing projects, but more of trying to get, you know, everything that's happening, including SB 107. Uh, there's a potential for county zoning and how we can work better. One of the charges we're seeing in the comp plan a lot is how we can work better with outside agencies. So how we can you know build those processes and it's a challenge when everybody's up to their eyeballs with case you know what about projects. for for utilities jason will it will the moratorium for a year is that going to give y'all any any uh, uh leeway to catch up it will help it's long overdue it will help how long would you act would you think you would actually need to really be able to make a dent well, the world has changed so in the last two years, it's hard for us to get materials, it's hard to get things done. Uh, 12 months, you know, I would love to see it longer than that, but that's not my call. We're gonna do the very best we can in the time we've got. But our problem is the further out areas, not downtown Fairhope, our problems are the areas that they've mentioned in this moratorium where we've got infrastructure improvements that's got to be made. I don't see our uh, in 12 months. I don't see our supply chain. Well, there's really some things at that all with our current administration. There's some. Well, I can't. I don't share that. I think the current administration is very supportive of well, us. No, no, you misunderstand it. I'm not talking about the city administration. I'm talking about the national administration. Oh yeah. <laughs> but there's some things that Hunter has brought up, and I, where our departments work great. Hunter's great fantastic but there's things we're going to do to improve the process there's a lot of things that y'all don't see that we're struggling with where things will happen and it'll go through the approval process with a set of drawings that you all see but when they go out and build the project it's a different it's not what we originally saw those are some loopholes that hunters worked hard and his department to correct and those are things that we're going to have hopefully time to get corrected by the time the moratorium's lifted but the utilities are struggling. Yeah. And putting in, you know, where, where are those priority areas for utilities and, and things like that? And, you know, one of the things we're all struggling with that was a little bit unforeseen, we had approvals for many projects over the years. And with COVID, with the supply chain, a lot of things went dormant. You know, even while it's booming, they just didn't start construction. And uh, I mean, we got hit at once. I mean, River Horse, as you saw, was three years, almost two years ago. They started construction three years ago. Yeah, I mean, we've got many projects that have come through this commission that have not broken ground yet. Yeah, we've had many, and, and y'all seen some of these extensions, and, and it's all hitting at once. And there's committal, so there's commitments that would have kind of been in our, uh, process that we would have had time for had it not been for this pause that everybody wants it at once 
and then we've also just seen a huge volume of cases at once. Mm -hmm. And they've, there's, in some situations, there's been some rhyme or reason to it. They fi they followed a, a comp plan for the most part. And others, it's just hit or miss. And, and you know, what I'm seeing for our utilities, and they're, they're out there, you know, trying to handle the new stuff, fix the old stuff, and make improvements for the, the overall infrastructure. You know, when's your 12 inch going down Fairhope Avenue? I know it's staging. You know, for if you don't see the improvements being made, you know, you're not looking hard. It, it, we, we do kind of drive by and don't and miss them sometimes, but with all the projects going on Church Street, on Fairhope Avenue, they're, they're happening everywhere. And there'll be more in the next couple of years. So I don't think of, construction, everything that's construction can't happen during this one year. So what, what kind of motion are you requesting? You request that we adopt the city council moratorium your, as a Your packet has a, a resolution that was, yeah. what was proposed um, after discussion with a few of you. And so mainly though, it would be a motion to adopt the resolution as it was presented. Okay. And then a, a vote would be necessary. All right, commissioners, anybody feel comfortable with that? If so. I, I move to adopt resolution number 20, 22-01. Okay, do I have a second? I second. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. I have a motion we adjourn. All in favor, aye. 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 aye.